Well, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, your moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap with some really interesting information, but before we get started with that, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you'll be able to access it on demand. Following the event, we will be sending out an email that will contain a link to the webinar that you can access on demand. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started with today's webinar. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us here uh, on the Inside a Docker Crypto Jacking Exploit uh, webinar with ThreatStack. My name is Mike Broberg. I'll be, uh, be hosting you, um, you good folks, today. And with me is uh, Ethan Hansen. He's a security analyst here in ThreatStack's SOC. Ethan, hello. Hello, Mike. Uh, good, to, <laughs> good to be here. Awesome. Well, thanks for thanks for uh, coming along for the ride. Uh, looking forward to walking through this uh, kind of Docker crypto mining thing we're going to talk about soon. But um, I guess first, uh, I will uh, just kind of kick things off by talking just briefly about containers. Um, you know, everyone here, I'm sure, knows what they are. But I think an interesting benefit of containers is that you know. They provide a, a certain level of isolation for your applications that makes them easy to kind of, you know, manage the life cycle of your apps. Um, so, you know, building on Linux primitives like namespaces and C groups, and you know, sharing you know hardware resources more directly on the host um, is kind of one way that they really you know enable that ease of use and kind of ephemeral ephemeral nature of containers where they're moving around, you know, um, being born and reborn constantly across your infrastructure. Uh, but like any new tool, um, you know, people can misuse them. Um, and just kind of emphasizing here that containers really are that kind of life cycle deployment tool when you're frequently deploying new versions of your application. And um, while they do provide a certain level of isolation, they're, they're not specifically a security tool. Um, it's not that full kind of isol isolation you would get when you're kind of running your own virtual machine with its own kernel and own virtualized hardware stack. Um, so just kind of trying to drive that point home that containers can, you know, if used properly, you know, uh, contribute to a defense and depth strategy, but they're not a security tool in and of themselves. One sec. Yeah, they're, they're good for, uh, for separating out your services, do some microservices type stuff, but, um, if somebody gets on one of your Docker containers and starts eating up your RAM, eating up your CPU, it's eating up the RAM and CPU of the host, uh, and it can do some denial of service type uh, type attacks there. Yeah, that's what we call here the denial of resources yep. or denial of wallet attack, because it'll <laughs> end up costing you uh, a kind of money and, and perhaps downtime as well. Um, and so, yeah, just uh, moving on real quickly, like we we just kind of touched on. Uh, denial of resources attack if you're kind of running a lot of Docker containers and someone wants to take down your your servers by spinning up a ton of containers. But there are other considerations too. Um, you know, just because you're running things in containers doesn't mean that security um, considerations kind of magically disappear. Uh, if you're using a you know an orchestration tool like Kubernetes, you know you have to that secure that control plane. You know. Um, if you log into your cloud provider, the same way you need to be careful about root access to your virtual hosts. Um, same thing with Kubernetes logging in um, to the web dashboard or using the command line tools. Um, if someone's able to gain access to your master node infrastructure on Kubernetes, they just could own all your you know servers that Kubernetes is is managing. Um, and then you know kind of further up the stack, if you're using managed container services, you know it's just that kind of shared responsibility. Uh, trust that you have to put in that provider. Um, yeah. All right. So moving on um, to our example, um, the uh, crypto jacking attempt on a Docker container that Ethan's going to get into. Um, I just kind of want to say, you know, he he works in our SOC. Um, you know, the folks in our you know security operations center are looking at events um, and alerts uh, on our customers infrastructure and in the signals that the you know kind of threat stack monitoring agent is, is sending up to the platform and you know 
uh, threat stack, just to kind of set some context, does this at the uh, kind of system call level, so it's able to kind of see what's going on in uh, the Linux kernel and get uh, folks kind of a real high fidelity um, signal of what their infrastructure is actually doing. Um, and yeah, it, it comes down to either you are reading a bunch of logs or you're you know, kind of triaging alerts and um, using a platform like ThreatStack, uh, that kind of stuff, that's what uh, Ethan is gonna kind of talk to today. So as Mike, as Mike put it so eloquently, uh, the ThreatStack platform is really powerful and you can use it in a couple of ways. Uh, you can use it to say, monitor your environment and get emails or webhooks or, or you know, using our API, you can get notified every time an alert comes into your environment and have your security team or your DevOps team or your engineers kind of manage it yourselves. Uh, or you can leverage the, uh, the threat stack uh, SOC and let us look at your environment and we'll go through and we'll, we'll triage alerts and we'll run them down and we'll give you all the context necessary to make a decision. It's more than just seeing an alert title. It's seeing the alert title. It's seeing everything associated with that alert. You know, we really dive deep on every single alert. Um, so just quick, give a quick, quick overview. Um, you know, step one really is the attacker needs to identify a website uh, or websites that are vulnerable to remote code injection. Uh, remote code injection is is pretty much when the attacker uh, is able to execute code. Uh, through a website, through like a console or the URL, any sort of way they're able to inject their own custom code and then that filters down to the operating system or in this case, the container. Um, so once the, the attacker uh, is able to do that, we move on to the next step. Uh, however the, the attacker does it, whether it's via the URL or whether via a live console or anything like that, uh, the attacker is able to take their... Uh, their code or their script or their command and execute in the application layer. Uh, and then that is then translated to the container. Uh, and then the container uh, is then spun up. And then the code is then executed inside the container. Now, around step three is where we at ThreatStack uh, in our platform will start seeing events. Um, not necessarily alerts, uh, depending on how your system is configured, uh, but we will start seeing events which will let us, uh, as security analysts, kind of rebuild the, uh, the attack as it happens. Uh, so this is an example uh, of an actual event from this attack um, where what we saw was Python-I, which means uh, the attacker was able to spawn an interactive Python shell uh, and then was able to type Python code directly into this shell. Um, they didn't run a script, they didn't run anything like that, so we didn't see any arguments, but this is our first indication of, okay, something is kind of happening. Imagine that f it, for the majority of cases, if you ever have a container and you're seeing that someone's launching a, a shell in that container, that's that's kind of your first big red flag. Yeah, uh, in, in this case, it's it's Python interactive shell. We do have alerts on, you know, services running shell and stuff like that, but, right. you know, this is, your first indication sign is going a little weird. Um, so step four uh, that happened live, uh, we saw in the customer environment, is that a crypto mining executable uh, was downloaded to the local file system. Uh, and I kind of want to stress here that the next series of events happened all within about a second of each other. Um, most likely somebody pasted in an entire script, hit enter, uh, and all, everything started happening. So what we see here uh, is the attacker uh, running a wget, uh, naming it cnrig, and going to get uh, this Linux executable, uh, downloading it to the local file system. Um, this is kind of the, the first step here, the first thing the script did. Um, cnrig, in this case, uh, is the crypto miner they downloaded. Uh, it's a relatively high performance uh, CPU miner, and the real distinguishing feature here is that it auto updates. Uh, it's got also compatible with all distributions which means you can download it, run it, and forget it. Um, you know, which is probably why it's, it was used in this particular attack to be like, oh, I'll just download this, it'll run, and I won't have to worry about it, it'll just continue to mine me. Yeah, this seems like it's like really one of those kind of like low effort, kind of cast a wide net uh, attacks that is common with a lot of hackers. Yeah, no, uh, you know, very common with the, you know, hit as many targets as I possibly can, and, and, and what comes what may. 
um, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with crypto mining right. if you do it on your own systems. <laughs> just, yeah. Just want to just want to stress that there. It's you know, there's there's people who uh, who make legitimate businesses out of crypto mining. Just do it on your own systems. Build your own crypto rig. Yeah, build your own crypto rig. Uh, don't abuse other people's. <laughs> um, then we start getting into the real red flag area here. Uh, modifying permissions. Uh, in this case, we saw chmod plus x uh, on CNRig. And what that means is chmod uh, basically is changing the, uh, the permissions on the file and saying, uh, please give me the owner executable permissions, which means they don't have to do anything special to run this file. Uh, they can just basically run it as it is. It'll execute and run. Um, and this is something that, in general, you should not be seeing on containers. Containers are meant to be non-interactive. They're meant for microservices. They're meant to run a system level type stuff. If you start seeing chmod plus x in your containers, unless you are literally sitting in front of a console, <laughs> that's, that's a sign that something starts going a little weird. And again, depending on your environment, you can craft an alert to say, OK, if it's a container and I start seeing chmod plus x, shoot me an alert. Which someone like you would see. Yeah, and someone like me would see. <laughs> and then we would dig into it. And we would, we would send you a nice email saying, did you really mean to do this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the next step uh, is executing the crypto mining application. Uh, you know, dot slash CNRig, uh, which in the Linux parlance is execute. It's basically the same thing as double clicking on EXE in Windows. Um, and in this case, you'll see there's a lot of flags on this. Uh, you know, you've got his donate level, the, the type of currency he's using, um, his, his email. We saw his email. Um, and the pool he was using in the port. Uh, just to, to give some background, that pool is, um, you know, it's it's basically a collection of servers, uh, usually sitting behind a load balancer that, you know, it, it goes out and it's like, okay, server A, server B. Um, so in this case, it's just basically a collection of servers. Um, and this is where we got our we got our alert. The CN, uh, the CN rig actually running uh, is when the threat stack SOC first saw the uh, the alerts. Uh, as soon as that executable ran, uh, we got an alert. Uh, we got the, this alert right here: uh, potential exploit activity, process activity from the temp directory. Uh, this is part of the base rule set. Uh, it looks for any sort of process activity from the temp directory, whether it's a start, a connect, and accept, uh, because malware has a tendency to run out of the temp directory. Um, uh, you know, if somebody is trying to get escalate privileges, the temp directory is usually a pretty good place to start, because uh, usually uh, you should config you should not configure it this way. Uh, anybody can uh, download and execute stuff out of the temp directory. Um, so we saw this, and we saw CNRig, and some research later was like, oh wow, that's a crypto miner. We should probably keep digging into this. Um, and all the slides you saw earlier, uh, you know, was our investigation. Kind of we pieced together this uh, this after the fact. You know, we did some digging, and we found that the last step in this was CNRig attempted to make outbound network connections. Uh, so it attempted to go from the container through the host and through the public internet. Uh, and uh, these are the three connections it attempted to make. Um, it made two over that port we saw earlier uh, as part of the pool, uh, and it made one connection over 443, which is commonly associated with HTTPS. Uh, to what looks what looked like a content delivery network. And I want to say attempted here uh, because uh, these connection attempts did not repeat. Uh, normally with processes that make network connections, you see multiple network connections over and over again, and it keeps doing it over and over again. And it's really important, too, that you were able to find the, the context of like when those connections opened, or, you know, around that, like... Who opened them? You know what were they? You know what commands preceded the opening of those connections? Because if you were just looking at it from the network layer, like you wouldn't, you yep. wouldn't have that. It's great the fact that we can recreate this entire attack sequence. Um, we can trace back the processes. We can say with pretty, you know, definitively, this spawned this, which did this. Whereas, yeah, you're right. If we were just looking at the network layer, we wouldn't be able to see that. It looked like any other, it would you, know, look, you know, SSL connection or yeah. whatever. And we do this with every single alert. We go in, we find parent processes, we find connections, we find associated processes. What did that person do before? What did that person do after? And having that visibility into the application, into the host, is amazing. 
Um, so that's really, you know, seven steps of a, of a, of a crypto miner attack. Um, in This actually happened. Um, we caught it. We researched it. We reached out to the customer. Um, and that's kind of what the SOC does. We see things. We research them. Reach out to the customer. And 99.9% .9 of the time, yeah, it might be nothing. But then this this shows that you know, 0.1%, that 1% of the time that, yeah, we, we see and we catch <laughs> legitimate, actionable uh, events. And you're someone who likes reading logs, too. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> I, I really am, you know, coming from the, uh, the, uh, the system administrator background, you know, I'm very used to trolling through logs manually. And if I had to troll through a log manually to find this, like I've, I've done stuff like that. I've picked out the needle in the haystack and being able to use a platform that kind of picks out the, the first needle for you and allows you to very quickly uh, find associated events is, is great. Right you know, on. I, I really like that. So uh, let, let's talk about misconfigurations, and misuses of Docker. Yeah. So I, I'll just kind of recap like a, a couple things, you know, you, you kind of addressed in your talk and, you know, maybe there, there are a couple other things that we didn't explicitly address, but, um, you know, inbound HTTP requests uh, to containers. To me, just as someone who like has played with Docker locally on their machine and and uh, kind of has an idea of microservices infrastructure, like if you're using containers as, you know, immutable infrastructure, right? Like um, being aware of which ones are, you know, able to talk to the, the network is, is really important because e either you have like something like Nginx that's, you know, load balancing or might be acting as a web server, or you have like application layer stuff that you probably don't want to be network addressable. So, so that's a, that's just a big, I think, first takeaway for me is like knowing which of your containers can can talk to the wider internet and not, and having a real justification for, for yeah. why. And it's like having a container doesn't solve the general issue of like having a, like what a DMZ is supposed to be or. You know, you shouldn't have your application layer talk to the internet directly. You should have a very specific pipeline and stuff should live in the DMZ and shouldn't be the public internet. Um, you know, Docker and microservices are great, but you still have to have that mindset of, okay, lowest possible attack surface, only expose what needs to be exposed, which leads us into, uh, you know, SSH and Docker. Right, yeah. So, I mean, that was, <laughs> we, we did explicitly call this one out, which was basically anytime you have a container that has a shell launched inside of it, um, that's usually a, a big warning sign. Unless, like Ethan said, you're literally sitting at the console doing it yourself. Yeah, the, uh, you know, ThreatStack has a, uh, a set of, uh, of Docker rules that follow the, uh, the CIS guidelines. And one of them is SSH server running in the container. <laughs> per the CIS guidelines, you should not be doing this you should SSH into the host and then jump from the host to the Docker container. That's the way you're supposed to be doing it. If you're running microservices, like you shouldn't really be SSHing in the box. Like if you're running a SQL server, would you be SSHing in the SQL server all the time? <laughs> Unless you're running maintenance or something like that? No, you have it automated. Right. Like that's the entire point of like kind of right. that microservices kind of model. You have a DBA who's doing it like right there in person. Yeah, which I mean, I, I guess SQL Server is a bad example here because like <laughs> DBA has got to administer it, but you, you get what I'm saying. Here. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, yeah, so running Docker is root. So I guess we didn't really talk about this, but running privileged containers is just um, something to to really be aware of because you know I'm I'm not uh, you know a Docker expert, but I know enough that the way Docker kind of remaps you know user IDs from outside of the container and then inside the container if you have privileged containers running in your infrastructure then you need to know which ones have rootly powers um, yeah across it, your host. it's like you know it's all about your business model um because sometimes you can't avoid privileged containers right um but it's really knowing what's privileged containers you know reducing your attack surface using service roles like making sure that okay let me define a specific role that has a specific set of permissions and i know that this role is running docker like just a general kind of just reduce your tax service as much as possible and just be aware of what's running as, um, you know, a privileged container in your environment. Yeah. And, uh, in, in this one we, we, we covered, um, it's just having, you know, a container with the underlying file system, you know, as writable. Right. And that, that was a big kind of thing that let, um, the potential crypto mining 
you know, uh, event happened in the first place, right? In, in the scenario yep. you ran through? So uh, without going into how Docker maps things in terms of the Linux file system, uh, basically, uh, you know, as it says in the last point, you're, you're not supposed to make the underlying file system that's like on the host writable. Um, you should explicitly define a container volume, you know, explicitly define a directory, and don't just let things get written to, the, to temp or anywhere. Uh, because then you run into issues of people downloading executables and making them, modif making them executable and running them. Uh, so that's, again, that's a CIS guideline that we have. That's a severity one that says you start your Docker container with the root file system writable. <laughs> and I, you know, again, this is within your business model, but you should plan, you should be very careful of, do I really need the root file system to be writable? Am I running a microservice that's automated? Like, do I need this to be, to be writable by anybody basically yeah and it's yeah like you said it's a matter of the business model if if you have a legitimate business reason for having to do that then by all means like know that that's like security risk that you're assuming and and uh you know you'll be you'll be fine you'll be able to put kind of checks in other places exactly like if you know in terms of threat stack you know you you're working with your your the, the security engineer on your on your account and you say, My business model says I need my root file system as writable. We know that we can, you know, work with you to say, Okay, let's let's come up with a customer rule that says only this specific directory should only be writable and then you can use FIM rules or stuff like that to say, Okay, so I'm aware of this, I'm gonna work to make controls around this. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the, the last big one on here is, you know, you limit not set. And I know that that kind of touches on the kind of uh, denial of resources kind of idea we, we chatted about earlier. Um, I don't know if you have anything more you want to add in terms of kind of setting kind of resource limits on containers, how much they can consume from a specific host, something like that. Yeah. I mean, in general, your container shouldn't be allowed to use 100% of your host resources. Um, again, this goes back to your business model. It's like, okay, if you're just running a simple web server, probably doesn't need to, and you're running, you know, some, uh, host with 256 gigs of Ram and like 16 cores, like these are your web server really need to use 256 gigs of Ram. Yeah. Uh, and that goes back to the denial of resources. Um, somebody could, you know, get onto your Docker container and spike your CPU and spike your memory and, then that's actually spiking your host memory and your host CPU, and then it leads you to a whole another uh, world of hurt, basically. Yeah, right on. Well, I think that's I think that kind of recaps everything there. Um, and uh, kind of before moving on to the the Q and A, I'd just like to reinforce. You know, um, I hope Ethan has kind of given you a good idea of what the ThreatStack Cloud SecOps program is, um, what it does. You know, we have. Uh, Many other uh, security analysts like Ethan um, looking at people's th threat stack um, alerts, digging into events in their threat stack accounts, and and you know raising their hands and you know letting folks know like, hey, um, we investigated this. We think this is like a you know highly legitimate area for you to prioritize your security response in, and um, and kind of go from there. All right, great, great webinar. Um, lots of great, interesting information. So um, I did want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the event, or you just want to listen to it again, just uh, know that you'll be able to do so on demand. We will be sending out an email that will contain a link to the webinar on demand. Um, the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So uh, you can always check there. And then while you're there, you can... Uh, check out the other webinars that we have both upcoming and on demand. Hopefully there'll be one or more that pique your interest. For now though, I'd like to thank you for joining me today and thanks to our esteemed panelists for joining me. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I'm signing off. Have a great day everybody.